This morning uh, we have Colin McMaster from the New South Wales DPI based in Cowra uh, to talk uh, summer weeds with us. Now I was fortunate to hear Colin present when I was at the Wagga um, GRDC crop update uh, about this time last year and I thought it was a great story and it's very um, pertinent to this time of year of course is, is summer weed control and and Colin and his group and, and amongst other researchers who he can mention uh, really did summer weed research properly and there's a great story to tell about moisture and about nitrogen. So good morning Colin, how are you going there? Yeah, good Pete. Yeah, so tell us a little bit, firstly Colin, just a little bit more about yourself, where you're based and who you work for and, and where the, how this work came about. Yeah, sure, Pete. So uh, I'm actually now a research and development agronomist for New South Wales DPI based in Cowra. Um, I've been in that role for the last couple of years and prior to that I was the district agronomist based in Forbes. So um, as far as this particular research, how it came about, back in 2008, 2009 uh, during the drought, we were doing a lot of paddock demonstration strips. Uh, obviously. Uh, they were a run of really dry years and we're trying to figure out what are the key drivers for retaining summer moisture um, and thankfully uh, due to the GRDC water use efficiency project that was led by CSIRO, uh, we were then able to sort of really do some more in-depth trials on that particular topic which was great. Excellent. Yeah and when I saw your work it was really interesting and um, we haven't had that level of work done in Western Australia um, but uh, certainly you're going to show us some great work in your part of the world and I guess while we're talking Colin during the session we sort of need to just see if we can think about how it applies to other parts of the country. It's always difficult to extrapolate but um, but yeah we'll just see just see if we can work out how that applies um, because obviously we have sandy soils in Western Australia here um, and then you've done your trials on some decent soil so yeah if we if we sort of um, mention what those soil types are as we go and then see if we can work out how it applies to other regions, that would be great. But anyway, I'll hand over to you, Cole, and you can go for it and I'll interject a bit and as questions come in, we'll stop and we'll, uh, and we'll do some questions. So, far away, mate. Terrific. Thanks, Pete. Just before I get started, I'd just like to acknowledge the rest of the team. So um, we had uh, from Syrah, we had John Kierkegaard and James Hunt and they were invaluable through this project and then we had Nerily Graham, Barry Haskins and Ian Menz uh, in the former, uh, formerly as district agronomists and we also had Jim Cronin from Landmark and Matt McRae that were actually involved in the series of trials that we ran. So firstly, just to give you a bit of a summary, um, over about a five year period we were measuring our summer fallow efficiencies in central west New South Wales and they varied anywhere from zero to 60% uh, and they appeared to be um, three key factors that affected our fallow efficiencies and that was related to soil type, management and rainfall distribution. So soil type, that was just the influence of texture and structure, so comparing a, a sandier soil compared to a heavy clay. Uh, management by far had the greatest impact and that was directly related to controlling our summer weeds and then also rainfall distribution. So obviously November, December rainfall isn't going to be as valuable as say March, April, May rainfall. However, that's a really big generalisation and it really depends on where that moisture is going to be stored within the profile. Um, so for example, uh, if it's stored below that evaporation zone of 20, 30 centimetres, obviously it's going to be very valuable. Um, just before we move on, there's just a really key point that we've got to get across here. So we're going to be talking a lot about actually capturing and storing that moisture during that summer period, but just as importantly, don't forget we still need to grow a root system to utilise the moisture. So don't forget all your other agronomic packages that will allow us to grow a root system to make sure we actually transpire that moisture back out of that profile. So Colin, that term fallow efficiency is one you guys use a bit more than I've heard in other parts of the country. Can you just, is that just as simple as the amount of rainfall that falls? It's the yep. amount that you actually can use with the crop, is that that you store? That's right. It, essentially, uh, how much rain fell during that summer period? What percentage of that rainfall could become available for the following crop? Yeah. For the next year. Yep. So back in 2010, um, we had three trial sites. We had one at uh, Forbes, 
Condo and Rankin Springs uh, representing different production zones, so more your, your medium rainfall zone and your low uh, rainfall zone. On those particular trial sites, we were actually assessing um, different tillage treatments, so we had stubble standing, we had deep ripping, we had cultivation, and we also had um, stubble slash treatments. And what we were really trying to identify, what is the key driver for retaining summer moisture? And, that, and does that lead to increases in grain yield? So there's our various um, stubble treatments. So that was our, the deep ripper that we ended up using on one trial site, uh, an agro plough. I'll just skip through these fairly quickly. And then for our stubble slash treatments, we used a K-line stubble cutter. And then uh, for our cultivation treatments, um, we ended up using a set of offsets. So that's what a trial site uh, look like. You can see there we end up having a cultivation treatment, our stubble standing here. This through here is our stubble slash treatments and then we've got our deep ripping treatments over there. Now what we ended up putting on top of that was a range of weed control treatments as well. So we had a nil spray, a misverse spray, a complete spray and a delayed spray. So the nil spray was when we had, um, where we didn't control any of our weeds during the summer period except for a knockdown just before sowing. Uh, the Miss First spray is um, self-explanatory. Uh, the complete spray is when we had weed control was conducted 10 days after a significant rainfall event. A uh, significant rainfall event we, we called you know, greater than 20, 25 millimetres of rainfall. And the delayed spray was when we left weed control, we delayed it for another 14 days after that. So basically we we're trying to mimic what growers are struggling with. Uh, do I get in and spray early? Do I be a bit trigger happy um, 10 days after a rainfall event and then hit it? Or do I actually leave it another two weeks after that, let more weeds to germinate and then actually um, apply the, the herbicide? So you're going to go into this in more detail, aren't you, Colin? But this is a critical part of this research, isn't it? Is just how quickly do you get out there and, and spray? Yeah, correct, Pete. Correct. So, and I'll I'll go through that as we as we get through it, because really this weed control um, ended up becoming the most important thing out of this this entire project. It was far more important than our than our stubble treatments, as you'll soon see. So. That site there is early on the piece, that's at a, um, a trial site in Tottenham. And then this is later in the season. Now this is back in 2010 and you can see the, the, the patchwork of treatments that we have there. So each plot was 12 metres by 12 metres. So obviously in here we've got our stubble standing with um, complete control of summer weeds. Over here I'd say this one here is going to be our, our nil. We control, this will probably be our miss first. You can, you can see the different treatments in there. Now this particular site, it was really wet. We had 467 millimetres of rainfall during the summer fallow period and there was very little difference between the treatments just from a moisture perspective. So uh, I must confess, I really thought that uh, we wasted an awful lot of time because we had such a wet summer. However... <laughs> What weed are we looking at there, Cole? What weeds have we got in there? Yeah, that essentially an awful lot of black grass yeah. in there at, at high density, so mainly black grass. I uh, probably should also let you know, Pete, this particular uh, trial site is more on a, a sandy clay loam as yeah. far as a soil, soil type is concerned. So really wet site. When we're actually doing the soil coring, all the cores you know, went down just as quick, if, if you know what I mean. There was very little differences in moisture. There was only 22 millimetres less plant available water in the nil spray compared to any of the other treatments. So, look, not much difference. Nothing like a summer weed control trial to get a lot of summer rain. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what or I thought. Or none I must confess, <laughs> I thought I should have gone water skiing instead, Pete. But, um, yeah. but early on, so, you know, after we did all the soil coring and we actually sowed the crop, I really wasn't expecting to see that much differences. But however, you can see here, we started to see some very um, big differences early on in crop development. So even during sort of early to late tillering, these two plots here, so this is the complete spray plot in here, and then on this side you have the delayed spray. And there was the huge differences in vigour between these, these two plots. So um, both had the same amount of moisture. The difference that we're seeing there, it's purely just the nitrogen response trial. 
So if we just go to the next slide here, here's our soil nitrogen levels. Now these are the nitrogen levels that we've taken just before sowing. And you can see here we've got our different stubble treatments. Um, you can see here the complete weed control. It's a very low, we've got our nitrogen levels down here in our treatments, our spray treatments. The complete control had about 40 units of N. Compared that to the nil spray, we were down to 8, 9 units of N. And you can see the trend there. The greater the delay in controlling our summer weeds, the greater the nitrogen loss that we actually had. So can I just clarify, Colin, how many how many sprays did the complete get and how many did the delayed get? Yeah, the, de the complete and the delayed had the same number of sprays and during that summer they actually had three sprays over the summer fallow period. It's just so the delayed three. spray. Yeah, so they had three summer fallow sprays. It was quite a wet summer. Yeah. And... Um, but the delayed was always an additional 14 days later than the complete. So the complete was when we sprayed it 10 days after a significant rainfall event. Yeah. And the delayed treatment was when we left it another two weeks after that and then we sprayed. Well, that's an amazing difference for a two-week delay. That's huge. Yeah, and, and you know, it's a very visual difference and we started to see that really early on. Yeah. Um, and, and then we just saw those differences as the, the crop progressed. Uh, now, I hope you can actually see here on your screen, uh, for the spring field day, we didn't actually put any signs out, uh, but the growers could go through and they could actually pick the spray treatments with, with no signs. So over here, that was our nil spray. I hope hopefully you can see the crop step up there. That was our Miss First spray, and then here, that was our complete spray. So the yield just increased as we um, controlled our summer weed. So that's just another photo of the same thing. The difference is there. That was the nil spray treatment on this side and here's the complete spray. Here's our yields just down here. So the nil spray ended up going one tonne to the hectare and the complete spray was 2.4 tonnes to the hectare. So the return on investment for that particular trial site, every dollar we invested in a herbicide spray ended up returning $4.60. So a, a fantastic return and keep that in mind that that was in a really wet year. So it was really just a nitrogen response trial. The moisture was a very key, fa a very insignificant part of that particular trial. Yep. So that was the Tottenham site. So that's in a, uh, for us anyway, Pete, uh, like a sandy clay loam. So that's on one of our more lighter soils uh, for New South Wales. Uh, then we moved to another trial site, which is in between Parks and Forbes uh, at a place called Gunning Bland. Now this is a really heavy clay site um, in the medium rainfall zone. We didn't receive as much rainfall. Uh, we only ended up receiving 270 millimetres in crop rainfall. And can you see here, from a visual perspective, it was nowhere as visually, that, that Tottenham site, you could see that black grass, it was very visual, the amount of weeds that were in it. This particular trial site, it didn't have the density of weed burden, but you had more things like um, heliotrope, you had some milk thistles in there, um, but not as much grass as in this particular trial site. So there's our, our patchwork of treatments, exactly the same trial. Uh, the difference was that during the summer, at the end of the summer fallow period, we retained an additional 49 millimetres of moisture and we also retained an additional 49 units of N just by controlling our summer weeds. So on this site, we had a moisture and nitrogen benefit by controlling our summer weeds. So those numbers there, is that the complete spray versus the nil, is it? Uh, is it yes, Pete, that previous slide. Correct. So, so those numbers there. Yeah. 49 millimetres of plant available water compared to 49 units of N, comparing yeah. the nil and the complete. And the main weed we've got here? Uh, the main weed in there was things like uh, heliotrope, uh, there was um, milk thistle in there as well, and, and some wire weed yeah. was in there as well. Yeah. And this is that same, basically the same trial site as what it looked like later in the year. So here, we have the nil spray, and then over there, that's our complete spray treatment. So it was a massive difference. So yes. the nil yeah. spray, 2.2 tonnes to the hectare, 
uh, go to the complete spray, it was 3.74 tonnes to the hectare and the delayed spray was 3.1. So again, by delaying our spraying, we lost yield. Um, interesting on this particular site, it's worth noting that, can you see the miss first spray here was just as good as the complete spray? Mm. Now, this is on a really heavy soil type, a heavy clay, and we only received 20 millimetres. Uh, now, this was back, uh, say, during the 2009-2010 summer, which was, uh, 2009 was a really dry year for us. Uh, then we only received 20 millimetres of rain and I went out and sprayed it. However, being a heavy clay, a lot of that moisture would have been stored within the top five centimetres. So this can actually hold 50 millimetres of moisture, 40 to 50 millimetres of water within the top 10 centimetres. It's a really heavy clay. Oh, really? Wow. Um, but plant available, it's only about 20, but as far as um, total moisture that it can hold, so obviously that's going to be stored within the top five centimetres, therefore we lost that to evaporation very quickly. So this is a critical point, isn't it? If we only get that small rainfall event and it only can wet up the top, say, 10, 20, 30 centimetres of soil, that's going to dry out anyway, isn't it, regardless of weeds. It's really those rainfall events where you get that moisture below that sort of 30 centimetre evaporation level that is really the moisture that we can store. Yeah, that's that's when it's 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 really safe. Uh, it's it's not a it's a no-brainer decision when it's like that. Even but Pete, I think uh, it's really a matter of knowing yeah your soil type and how that influences it. But if you end up just getting a small amount of rainfall um, and the weeds can actually get away and germinate, um, then they can become obviously if you leave it. Uh, it can be very hard to kill basically. If you get further rainfall yeah. after that, you've got a very big weed to actually contend with uh, mm. to try and actually kill. And so it can actually, your next rainfall event, it can actually lose a lot of moisture really quickly. So, yeah, yeah I've got my thoughts are be aware of your soil type, but quite often it's, it's better to spray than not to spray. And we've got a couple of questions come in. Uh, one of them is at the Tottenham site, was root depth and root diseases and nematode levels measured for each treatment? Uh, yeah, it was. So we did a, a predictor B test um, on all the different treatments and actually nothing ended up getting teased out out of that within the predictor yeah. Bs. Yeah, and the rooting depth? Uh, the rooting depth there, being such a wet year, we didn't go through at the end of the year and actually put a soil core down to see what the rooting depth would have been, but I'm certainly it's got the ability to go to 1.2, you know, 1 to 1.2 metres. Okay. It's not, and it's there's not another, a question, uh, another question come in which I know you're going to get to, but I'll, um, it's a question about do you think uh, the nitrogen difference can be made up with additional nitrogen at planting? Now, I know you're going to get to that one, Colin, so we'll park that one for a minute and keep going. Yeah, no worries at all. So that's the Gunning Bland site there. So we'll go straight onto it right now, yeah, Pete. Yeah. So, yeah, look, we, we had the same question. So when we were at a, a spring field day, the growers were, we were looking at the difference between these two plots here. So um, the difference here is obviously we had a extra moisture, um, but we also had that 49 units of N difference where we didn't actually control our summer weeds. and the question was, rightio, let's say we, we finish harvest up and we end up going on holidays, we let the summer weeds get out of control, would it be profitable to try and replace that nitrogen with, with fertiliser? So what we ended up doing, we ended up setting some trials in 2011 and 2012 to try and address those very issues. So we stopped doing the different um, stubble treatments and we concentrated purely on the weed control and also trying to replace uh, the lost nitrogen with fertiliser nitrogen. So what we have here, we have each plot is 12 metres by 12 metres and what we did, we ended up pre-drilling 50 units of nitrogen in and then we also pre-drilled 100 units of nitrogen in as well. So the reason that we used the figure of 50 units of nitrogen was because that's how much summer, the summer weeds took out was 50 units of N on that particular trial site. Now, obviously, we're not going to get 100% fertiliser recovery, so we put the 100 units of N to try and imitate, you know, if you're doing a budget, you might be going off a 50% a fertiliser recovery or efficiency. 
So the first question is, did the fallow sprays in 2011 and 2012, uh, did we actually retain more moisture? And you can see, yes, we did in both 2011 and 2012. So in 2011, uh, we end up retaining an additional 86 millimetres of moisture. And in 2012, we retained an additional 50 millimetres of moisture. So uh, if we look at the nil spray, you can see the trend here. The longer a summer weed was growing, the greater the loss in moisture that we're actually receiving. So very similar to that 2010 work. Where was that additional moisture conserved within the profile? So up the top here, we've got our plant available water and then down the side here is our soil depth. The red line is the nil spray and then the dark blue line is the complete spray and then the dotted line is the, the delayed and then the miss fur. So you can see there that we're retaining a lot more moisture um, that the key thing is at depth within the profile. So any of this moisture stored below this 20 centimetre layer here, you know, we can confidently say that we can't lose that moisture through to evaporation. We can only lose it due to a summer weed actually extracting that moisture out. Can the water go out the bottom of these soils or does it just stay there? Uh, look, Peter, it could. On our particular soil types, uh, generally speaking, that's not as big an issue for us. Right. So, uh, yeah, it, that's, yeah, I'm sure it's a bit more of an issue on a sandier soil, but we're in a soil type here that actually holds, so this is our heavy clay soil, so generally speaking we don't get much leakage on this particular soil type. Sorry, that's my WA Western Australian sandy soil <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, no, that's, that's, that's brain going there, but really the point is, is the only way you can suck that moisture from 80 centimetres out of there is with a plant, isn't it? Yeah, correct. We can't lose it through to evaporation. Um, so really that's the key thing. We want to make sure that we actually uh, grow a root system that can actually get in there and extract that moisture out. Mm. Uh, right to move on? Yeah. Yep. So as far as then the next thing, so yes, we know that we conserved uh, additional moisture in 2011 and 2012, but did we preserve more nitrogen levels like we did in 2010? And yes, you can see the same trend here. So we stored an additional 69 units of N in 2011 and 45 units of N in 2012. And again, the same trend here. So the greater the delay in controlling our summer weeds, um, the greater the loss of nitrogen that we had. Again, where was that extra nitrogen conserved? And it's a very similar looking graph to what the, the moisture graph is. So this is just mineral nitrogen up the top and our soil depth. The red line here is our nil spray and the dark blue is our um, complete spray. And again, you're seeing here that we're actually, the differences in nitrogen levels aren't just within the top 20 centimetres, but we've got additional nitrogen levels uh, at depth which is obviously going to be very nice if we're relying on subsoil moisture for crop growth, having that nitrogen down there is going to be invaluable. And a real key part of this is the relationship between moisture and nitrogen. So this is just showing the plant available water benefit over the nil spray treatment compared to the nitrogen benefit over the nil spray treatment. So what it's basically saying this graph that when we actually pull all these years together, for every millimetre of moisture that was lost via summer weed growth, we will also reduce our nitrogen levels by 0.56 units of N. So it's just clarifying that, look, when we're controlling our summer weeds, it's not just moisture, but it's also nitrogen is just as big a factor. Um, so that we're why, trying to conserve. why are we losing that N? How does that work? Yeah, good question, Pete. So, uh, there's a few different ways that we're actually losing that N. So we're losing that N via the weed, say, carcass, so the actual skeleton of the weed plant, um, that nitrogen is getting taken up into that. Also, by that summer weed growing, it's going to be drying out our soil profiles and therefore we're not going to be then getting the mineralisation of N during those summer months. So look, it's a really good time to access some of that free nitrogen. If we've got moisture during the fallow period, uh, that means and we've also got warm temperatures, so that's going to really drive that mineralisation process uh, as well. So it's a two, two, we're losing nitrogen two ways, weed carcass and also due to that mineralisation event. Okay. 
And that mineralisation of N, what depth is that happening at? How deep can that happen? Pete, all, um, look, we, all I can really refer back to is what we're actually seeing. So we're seeing big differences right down to, um, you know, we're getting differences down to 80 centimetres, not 90 centimetres here. So that's, I can't actually explain the mechanism because that wasn't really within the scope of the, the project, but we can just say that, look, we are actually getting big differences right down uh, to that 90 centimetre soil depth. I would say a lot of the mineralisation is actually taking place within the top 15, 20 centimetres. We've got more organic matter and organic carbon, but then as we're getting uh, rainfall, obviously that's sort of going to be pushing that nitrogen further down. So the rule of thumb we use here is that nitrogen moves about half the rate uh, of moisture sort of infiltrating down the profile. So if you, you get a, a rainfall event that pushes moisture down to 40 centimetres, that nitrogen moves down about 20 centimetres. I love rules so of that's thumb, that's a beauty. <laughs> so we're <laughs> mineralising in, in up the top and it's leaching down and then the summer weeds are sucking it out. Correct. Yeah. So is that explained, is that fine Pete? Yeah, that's excellent. We don't have any questions coming in, but just a reminder to everyone out there, send your questions in. We're really exploring this relationship between moisture and nitrogen at the moment, so I'm sure there's questions out there about that. So type one into your questions box and and uh, and we'll get it and we'll and we'll put it up. So if you keep ploughing on for a minute, we'll see if some questions come in, Colin. Yeah, sure. So that, that was the moisture and nitrogen side of it. We were also looking at the impact of summer weeds on other macronutrients. And I won't go into this in any, any detail because basically we didn't get any trends as far as phosphorus, potassium or sulphur at depth. Uh, we didn't pick up any, any trends there between the various spray treatments and those, those nutrients. So the big question was, uh, and I, going back to the earlier inquiry as well, was okay, if we apply that extra nitrogen, did we actually catch up? So this is the trial site which had canola in it. We've got our yield here and then we've got our various spray treatments. The key thing to look at here is the complete spray with no nitrogen, so there are various nitrogen rates, ended up going about 1.5 tonne to the hectare. The nil spray was around 0.6, but even when we added an additional 140 units, of nitrogen, it still didn't catch up to the complete spray with no end. So it's not saying that the nitrogen, um, you know, applying uh, urea doesn't work. You can see here that we're getting our yield increases from it, um, but it just highlights the value of controlling our summer weeds, um, you know, by actually storing that that moisture and that nitrogen. And I'd say we're getting a benefit of having that nitrogen stored, distributed more down the profile as well. So That's return on investment-wise. Mind-blowing result, isn't it? You would think 140 of it would catch up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. It was very, very interesting. It's not as though it didn't work, but certainly, um, you know, and obviously if you do the economics on it, uh, the return on investment... Can that one? Yeah, certainly can. That's not much of a response going from 0.6 to 1.2 with 140 of it, is it? No. For the new spray there. Mm. Yeah, that's right. And obviously, uh, now with this particular particular trial site, it's worth noting that um, we put 70 units of that N up front at summing time and then the other 70 units we put that on just before stem elongation. And what was the difference in the soil N between say your nil and complete spray at this site at, at seeding? Yeah, Sorry. I can actually, <laughs> no you're right Pete, I, I, I can find that one out for you. So, okay. It's the mineral N, I've just got it here in front of me, so the mineral N was uh, 2012, so we had 80 units, uh, sorry 2011 we had 44 units of N, compared that to 114 units of N in 2011, and in 2012 it was 80 units of N compared to 126 units of N. Yeah. So this particular trial result here is from 2011. So that we did have about 70 units difference, hence your rates that you used in your trial there. Yeah, correct, that's right, yes. Yeah. 
So yeah, big responses and really big return on investment. So you can see here return on investment from our nitrogen was around, uh, you know, between one to three dollars return for every dollar invested. But as far as our herbicide sprays, on the complete spray, we're getting around an eight dollars return for every dollar invested in herbicide control. But that also says if you didn't spray your summer weeds in this situation, you made no money by applying nitrogen to your crop. Correct. Yes. It's, it's, it's a really important, like really by actually controlling our summer weeds, um, you know, you're really setting up the yield potential of that crop in a fairly cost effective way. Yeah. So I've got so another I suppose just to summarise that. Yep. Sorry, Pete, do you want me to do the summary oh, or no, did you, you want to ask? Far away, do your summary and then we've got some good questions coming in. We'll, we'll cover some questions in a minute. Yeah. Sure. So, so in summary, out of the, the trial results uh, from central New South Wales here, 50, 60, 50 to 60 percent of our yield potential was attributed to summer weed control and that was largely due to nitrogen and moisture benefits. Um, don't forget the nitrogen and plant available water interaction benefits. So if you have higher moisture during the summer period, that means you've also got higher mineralisation of N potentially during the summer period. If you've got higher nitrogen, that's going to improve your water use efficiency. Um, don't forget basically that grain yield is a function of grain number and grain size. So it's no wonder that controlling summer weeds work. So uh, if we have more nitrogen, that's going to provide us more tillers and more grains per head. And if we've got more moisture, that's going to improve nitrogen uptake as well as grain size. So I think they're the reasons why we're getting, uh, for a very low cost, we're getting high potential returns. So it worked over a diverse range of seasons for us. So if we had a really dry to average season, the dollar return came by increased moisture and nitrogen. And if we had a really wet season like 2010, the dollar return came by increased nitrogen. Yeah, so that's a critical point, isn't it? Wet seasons, it's all about in. Dry seasons, it's more about moisture. Yeah, more, and probably moisture and in. Yeah, moisture exactly. And so, yeah, and it's in, very when rare. Have, when you've had a really Sorry, wet no. summer, it's sort of only about nitrogen, isn't it? Yeah, correct. That That's exactly mm. right, like we saw in 2010. Yeah. So I suppose that the take-home message of it would be, uh, with fertilisers being such a significant cost, uh, efficiencies can be made, cost save and profitability increase via those clean fellows. So that's sort of just trying to wrap it up. Excellent. So we do have some questions come in and, and we're just about finished. I'll let Colin do an, uh, an ad for that first. Oh, uh, yes, so Pete, this is just a bit of a um, uh, a booklet funded by GRDC that John Cameron and Andrew Story put together, which is a really good reference. So this is the Summer Fallow Weed Management um, Guide. I think it was put out back in uh, 2014, which is a really useful resource. And just before I um, hand over for questions, here's just the acknowledgements. I uh, really want to um, thank CSIRO. Uh, all the soil testing couldn't have been done without John Kierkegaard and James Hunt and also the, the dehydrators were done at Condo and Cow and also in uh, Canberra with CSIRO as well as the various growers that were involved. Yeah. So yeah, so that's about it mate. So any, any questions? Yeah, so I, um, and I also I've had a look through that summer weed book and it's, uh, it's a ripper and uh, so I would advise people to have a look at that as well if, if they found today's session interesting. So I'll send a tweet out about that as well shortly. So first question, so the vet, I'm not sure if it's a question or a statement really, the, the value of loss of soil nitrogen combined with the cost of water in an irrigated environment make even more financial sense. Any, so it is a comment, but any, yeah. any comments about the irrigation um, uh, system? Uh, look, I haven't done any work on the irrigation system, but I'd agree with uh, with, with the comment. So if you can serve more of that moisture and all, more of that nitrogen, I think it's also, sort of, I might be sidestepping it a little bit, I'm not sure Pete, but as in also if you're in a system that you're coming out of a pasture phase and you've actually conserved a lot of nitrogen during your, your pasture phase, if it's a, a legume dominated pasture, you've also got more to lose in your cropping phase if you let your summer weeds extract that nitrogen out, if that makes sense. So yeah. 
you know, the, the more nitrogen that you may have, whether that's due to your crop rotation or um, same with your, your irrigation, uh, you've also got more to lose by letting those yeah. summer weeds grow. Yeah. Now here's another one. Different. No, it's all right. I mean, if you haven't done the work, it's okay. But I mean, obviously, it does make a strong, you know, financial sense to um, yep. in an irrigated system as well as a a, um, a dry land system. Yeah. Yep. Um, here's another one. As the soil surface dries out during the growing season, is the crop limited in accessing the deep moisture due to limited P at depth? Ah, uh, due to limited P at depth. Um, that, that's also a very good question. So Mike Bell's done a lot of really good work of that up in um, in Queensland, and on some of those verticiles up there. And uh, it's probably best coming from Mike, but my understanding from that is that yes, they're getting some some really good responses to having that pea there at depth, because that's also going to then drive that root system to access more of that deeper subsoil moisture. Um, mm. So yeah, as far as I suppose it's depending on the area that you're at and what sort of phosphorus levels you you have at depth. But uh, look, yeah. I think that is a is a is a fair comment. Okay, so just a reminder to everyone that, out there. With, does that answer that? Yeah, no, that's I think that answers it. Yeah. So obviously, what's happening there is that the soil surface is drying out, and so the crop can't access phosphate in the topsoil. And that's going to limit it, the crops. And if there's no P at depth, it would limit the crop's ability to to put down deep roots. I think that's what it's saying. Is that right? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I, I, probably just another um, point on a similar topic to that, uh, Pete, is that also doing things like um, like early sowing. Some of the work that from the VSAP and James Hunt, what they're they're doing with the early sowing, and that's all about actually trying to um, grow a root system so it can actually get deeper down into that subsoil to actually access that moisture. You know, yeah. Compared to later sowing, you're not going to be able to get a root system down there to be able to extract and utilise that subsoil moisture. And I suppose every area is going to have its own impediments. That's you know, right. And I mean, we, we did a session at the Perth Crop Updates on this last week and I used some of your information, but one of the things we have here is if we, um, we might store a heap of moisture. Uh, in summer, but if we have soil acidity and compaction at depth, then you can't get it back um, because the roots might only go down 40 centimetres where we have you know, a compaction layer down there. So it may be all well and good to store moisture, but if the if the crop roots can't reach it, then you can do your dough. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I also had a question before the session actually on Twitter last week from Dave Minky, and it sort of was answered a little bit on Twitter about get your take on it. So if we have more stubble and that gives us a little bit more moisture retention in that topsoil for a little while, so stubble helps maintain moisture in the topsoil but only for a couple of weeks I'm told. Um, if we have that, does that increase nitrogen mineralisation? So there's a sort of a twofold thing happening. If we have more stubble we might mineralise more N but, more, but stubble takes a lot of N to break down to get the carbon to nitrogen ratio right, doesn't it? So it can sort of cancel itself out a little bit. Yeah, yeah, correct. Obviously, if you've got more stubble, and then if you end up laying it down or incorporating just before sowing, obviously you're also going to get more of that get tied up within, within, within the short term. So yes. I, my take on it, Pete, is look, stubble is is good. Um, it, it, you know, if you can keep it, that's that's fantastic. But it's sort of not the you know, not the the be all and end all that the weed control. As far as getting a return on investment by controlling our summer weeds, that's been working most years. Um, and the stubble, the benefits, you know, might get a good benefit. I remember back in 2009, and I've actually put a slide down here on that. So can you see that? Yep. Um, that's just showing the differences between having a little bit of stubble in some years. So this was 2009 in a really dry year. Um, that is behind the header, ended up going about 1.6 tonne to the hectare, compared to on the outside edge of the header, ended up going about 0.4 of a tonne to the hectare. But that essentially was a time of sowing trial. So where we had that little bit of stubble cover um, from behind the header, they were able to actually sow into moisture and get the crop up, compared to towards the outside, say, wings 
uh, it was dry and that crop didn't actually mm. get going for you know three weeks later sort of thing. So, so that's a crop establishment thing, yeah. That's, yeah. It's more of a crop establishment sort of thing. Yeah. So just to everyone out there, we're going to wrap this thing up within the next five minutes. So if you've got a last question, put it in now. We've got a couple here. So um, the other question that's come through, Colin, is do you think the same principles from this study would apply for pasture establishment? Uh, yeah, I could see no reason why they probably wouldn't. I haven't done any pasture work with it, Pete, but um, I suppose it depends on what sort of pasture that you're actually putting in. So I'm, you know, I'm thinking if the pasture was based, certainly from a moisture perspective, it's going to be beneficial. But if you're actually putting a, a, um, a legume-dominated pasture in there, obviously you're going to be actually trying to build your nitrogen levels levels up. But certainly from a moisture, controlling your summer weeds from a moisture perspective to get that pasture up and running, uh, I'm sure uh, it would be the same principle. Yeah, I think even a lot of legume dominant pastures benefit from nitrogen, so um, yeah, I would dare say you would see um, the same sort of response. Um, yep. Another one here, uh, and I'm not sure if I understand it, but it says it's fair to say that in WA's lighter soils, that in a wet summer, plant available water and nitrogen, um, we have lots of nitrogen leaching potential in a very wet summer. So um, I guess what that's saying is we could um, certainly do that early spray and um, and improve our nitrogen, but then if we get another big follow-up rain, we can lose our nitrogen at the bottom in, in you know on a very sandy soil. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah I'm not sure if I can sort of add any more. Uh, yeah, we've that, seen Pete. we've seen plenty of that in WA where yeah we get that nitrogen and then we get a big big rain um, and it just drops the nitrogen straight out the bottom. So yeah, it's one the basically what it's saying is is your study works fantastically well in good soil and probably not as well in sandy soil, but there certainly are benefits in sandy soil. Anybody that saw the um, the very deep ripping trials from Binu last year in WA very sandy soil, taking the yield from two tonnes in the unripped to 3.5 in the ripped, and that was really accessing um, deep summer moisture. So we do get big benefits in WA, but it's not probably quite as exciting as when you've got beautiful deep soil. Yeah. Um, okay, with speed tillers and Kelly chains, etc., being used more over summer to control weeds, particularly in canola and pulse doubles, has there been any work done on this system in terms of accumulating nitrogen and retaining moisture? Look, um, we're actually setting a trial up this year, actually doing. It's a different topic. We're using a speed tiller, but that's more about uh, the distribution of phosphorus. We're actually trying to change the distribution of phosphorus within the topsoil when it's sort of stratified in the top five centimetres. But um, look, all I could really refer to in, in this particular trial site where we used um, the offsets, uh, certainly by actually incorporating those stubbles in, in 2010, we actually ended up getting a bit more mineralisation uh, from that because obviously when you're getting the, the residues and you're putting that soil contact with it, it's actually going to be breaking that that down quicker and actually became, making that nitrogen become available quicker by actually doing yep. that. Yep. As far as from a moisture conservation perspective, uh, with our sites, you know, we weren't getting any, uh, the cultivation was, it wasn't actually any worse than the actual stubble standing or slashed in the trials that we've done. They were all the same. It was yeah. all from a moisture perspective. It was all about controlling your summer weeds. Okay. And another one here. Have you considered the allelopathic effects of summer weeds, such as goosefoot and hairy panic? Um, perhaps the cause for low incremental yield increase in the nitrogen supplementation trial. Have you done any work on this? So where you got poor yield response to nitrogen in that in that trial, could that have possibly been due to allelopathy? Uh, it, I suppose th there is the, the possibility of that. Uh, if you look at the nitrogen trial, so I just remember back in, uh, the, say, the Tottenham site that had a lot of that black grass in there, and because we, we did wonder about that, the allelopathy with all the, the black grass and so on in, in that particular trial site, and the mineral nitrogen levels, if we just go, I'll go straight to those. Uh, 
there we have there. So we've got around, say, the complete spray was around 40 units of N. Um, and then if we add on back of envelope stuff that we would say, we'd say right here, potentially we'd be getting around 30 to 40 units of N mineralization. So then we're up to around 80 units of N. And again, another rule of thumb is around 40 units of N per tonne of grain. That's sort of taking into account the various losses and efficiencies. Um, so you would expect that our nitrogen limited yield potential would have been around two tonne to the hectare. Compared to the nil spray here, uh, it only had eight, nine units of N. So if we add on that our mineralization of another 30 units, 30 to 40 units of N, you would su suspect that it would have only been around a yield potential of one tonne to the hectare compared to two tonne to the hectare. And that's basically what these yields ended up doing. So I, 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 my, my thoughts are that, that nitrogen was the key, the key factor, certainly in these trials anyway. I'm not completely aware of uh, the other particular species that you mentioned, Pete, as far as allelopathy. So, um, but it seemed to correlate very nicely with the nitrogen, the soil nitrogen yeah. it's sowing. All right. Thanks, Colin. I think uh, we'll wrap it all up there. So um, thank you, everyone, for attending. That's been a great session. It's brilliant work. And um, like I said, when I saw it in Wagga a year or so ago, I, I thought it was, was fantastic and definitely worth sh uh, sharing around. So thank you very much uh, for your time, Colin, and, and showing that to us. Good on you, mate. Thanks, Pete. And uh, just a reminder, everyone, there's another Weed Smart webinar, same bat time, same bat channel next week. Um, this week it's going, uh, next week we're going international. So we have uh, Pat Trannell from uh, Illinois University in the US. He's going to be joining us and telling us about um, the research that he did on uh, mix and rotate herbicides. So uh, it'll be an excellent story about the story of glyphosate resistance happening in the US and what they learned about herbicide mixes. So thanks everyone and hopefully we'll see you.